Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Canole, and welcome back once again here to another edition of the movie Battleground. And we are still in our first week of the new season. And what a better time than the beginning of a season to bring in some new recruits. And that's exactly what we have for you tonight. We have Jeremy Potters versus Ross Bristow. And the truth is, I don't know if anyone knows what to expect from either of these guys because they've never debated here. They've both had the opportunity to judge a little bit on the matches. I'm sure they've seen some stuff, but competing is different from judging in every sense because with judging, there's literally zero pressure. Who cares? You just have to sit there and listen, right? Now you have to talk, which is different. Uh, and so these guys are here to see what they have, see how it goes, and... Uh, Get into this. I mean, there's not really much amble or build up here. There's literally no pressure. This is just come out here, play, and see what happens. So let's talk to them. So introducing first, making his movie battleground debut, we have Ross Bristow. Ross, welcome to the battleground, sir. As a competitor, uh, how are you feeling heading into this as for your first debate here? Um, I feel okay. You know, I'm more of a trivia guy too, but you know, I think I do have some good points. You know, for for all my answers, and then you know. Like, and then, like, and I have some against his, you know, I don't know his points, but, you know, I, I watched, just finished, finished watching both the movies today, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, all right. So I'll go ahead and put you in the back and we will go ahead and bring in your opponent. Uh, also coming in for his debut here in the movie Battleground, he is Jeremy Potters. Jeremy? Sir, same as you. Welcome to the battleground for your first time as a competitor. Uh, how are you feeling coming into tonight's matchup? Uh, I feel great. Like you said, no pressure. Um, I am definitely already known as like just a trivia guy. I've never done this. And you said you had an opening, and I was there for that insane title match. Uh, it was an honor to judge that between the Amaru and and uh, Henry, and uh, that kind of like lit the fuse. So let's see if we can blow it up. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, at the very least, what's the worst that happens? It goes badly and you never do it again? What? what yep. What's that? I mean, let's just, you know, it never hurts to see how things go. Uh, so I'll go ahead and bring in your competitor. So I'm going to start by apologizing because I don't have any trivia questions, but we do have a couple of debate questions. So we shall see how that goes. Guys, are you ready to get into it? Oh, yeah. Let's hit it. All right. Movie Battleground is a game that is a best of five rounds. It is a first to three points wins the match. Each round of debate is worth one point. If a competitor happens to take the first three points in a row, that will be a victory by knockout. And if after our four questions, we have a two to two tie, we will go on to the blind round for the tiebreaker. But we will only trouble you with that mess if we have to. If we can avoid it, let's avoid it. Any veteran will tell you, let's avoid it. With that said, in terms of your first four questions, you guys have had the questions for a bit, even as much time as we can allow to prep for it. There will be a 60 second opening argument where you get the chance to establish what you're uh, debating for, followed by two minutes of your own speaking time to expand on your idea. There will be a four minute open discussion where you'll go back and forth, trade bars, and try and get some points in, and then you'll get 60 seconds to close and wrap up your argument at the end following that i have three judges backstage in the form of zach brian and jake they will join us on screen and based off of what you guys have said in the arguments will make their deliberation on who gets the point with all that said are you guys ready to go yes sir yep all right so let's go ahead and jump into it and for question number one as i load the timer in very sloppily at the end there uh question number one <coughs> excuse me uh, we are going to be talking about a, uh, a genre in film that I feel like because there are, well, how do I put this in a manner that seems appropriate? So many fucking shit entries has sort of devolved in Hollywood. It just doesn't, it's not really a thing that's done as much anymore, uh, because it's been ruined. We are talking about 
parody films. Uh, in that, I'm also including mockumentary films because I feel like it rides the same line. These are satirical films that, in at their best, are giving real commentary on the world around us while delivering some incredible jokes, and at their worst, are directed by Friedberg and Seltzer. With that said, the question is, I mean, it's the fucking truth. <laughs> the question is, what is the most underrated mockumentary or parody film of all time? And again, these are one category together, so the competitors could select either or. Um, so with that said, behind the scenes, normally we use any kind of stats breakdown to determine who is the favorite, which if you've ever played the game, you know that the favorite means you get to choose which questions you go first on. It has zero bearing on the actual match. Uh, we have no stats here. So we did a coin flip. Jeremy won the coin flip. Uh, he chose to go first on questions one and three, which means Ross will have the honor of going first yep. on questions two and four. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and bring in your timer. I'm going to wish you guys both the best of luck on your first round here. And Jeremy, you will have one minute to speak. Time starts when you begin speaking. So you can take a second if you'd like. Um, when I chose this as my strength, because I did, I just saw the term mockumentary. Uh, Aaron told me later that it was parody was lumped in. I didn't care. I knew what I was picking. Uh, and the most underrated mockumentary or parody ever is Christopher Guest Best in Show. It's an awesome movie full of hilarious people giving hilarious dialogue, that a lot of which is probably ad-libbed. Uh, but it really shines this silly little light on the world of competitive dog shows, which is probably a silly little world. Um, he, Out of the movies that Christopher Guest has directed, this is by far the best, even though the others are really great, too. So, um, thanks. I yield my time. All right. So, we'll go ahead and let the timer count down there since we're close enough. So, we have best in show for our first pick. Ross, once the timer clicks over to zero, you are good to go ahead and start your opening minute. If you need me to pause the clock for you, I can as well. Okay. Okay. Mine is actually, you know, also a Christopher Guest film. But I actually think it's better. And then, like, actually, like, whenever people talk about Christopher Guest movies, they always talk about Best in Show. But mine is called For Your Consideration. And then, like, it is it is about, like, you know, like, like what people will do just to get nominated for an Oscar and how they basically lose themselves. And then, you know, like, and the pretentiousness of it. Yes, and then, yes, I do love love for your consideration and then like i actually think it has like funnier jo jokes and best in show and i will explain later so yes i yield my time all right so we have a christopher guest face off here uh not a problem it just means i can reuse this question later but with that said we do have two great movies the argument continues jeremy you have two minutes on the clock when you begin speaking the thing about Best in Show is that it's not just a great mockumentary. It's a great display of teamwork in filmmaking. The movie is essentially broken down into a story of a bunch of different duos. right? You have Parker Posey and Michael Hitchcock as like the manic, insane, super sensitive dog owners who think their dog has every condition and is going to freak out if they don't have their toy when the dog just sits there and watches them go crazy. Uh, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara team up always, and it's always great, whether it's any of the Christopher Guest movies, Shit's Creek, and they bring it as the flex with their little Yorkies. It's fantastic. Uh, Jennifer Coolidge and Jane Lynch are paired together, and where, where Jane Lynch is just the supposed to be the trainer of the dog, but she takes over. Like, she's the one that's really in charge. Like, she owns it and controls the situation. And that allows for a lot of great lines and back and forth. And But the best is Fred Willard and Jim Pittick as the announcers. Because Fred Willard comes in with the most insane, nonsensical commentary. Because he's coming in as a guy who has no idea about the dogs. He asks the most ridiculous questions, and Jim Pittick never flinches keeps it straight, plays it straight the entire time, even looking concerned at times. And when you add all these little stories together, they're great. But then at the end of the day, it's really a story about just a guy and his dog. Like, they're not fancy. He's a hunter. His dog's a bloodhound. They just hang out by the river. And at the end of the day, they're the ones that went out 
and it just shows that being normal and kind of being conditioned for what you're doing, good things will come out. You don't have to lose your mind and be insane. So it's at the end of the day, it's just a sweet little story. Thank you. All right, that is time. Ross, back over to you. Two minutes on the clock. Okay. Mine, I actually think is a funnier version of that is because like, you know, you know, you know, you know, now like why why you think of them as duos, but mine, everyone's single. And then, and then like, you know, like about like how crazy Catherine O'Hara is. And then, you know, you know, you know, you know, like, like, and then like how funny, um, how, how funny, you know, like Harry Shareer is. And then now like about like how, how now like all the people, every single one losing themselves but the one guy that you that actually ends up getting nominated he actually sleeps through the nominations and and then it shows them you know, like later on how they all lost themselves except for him him and then you know you know now like like and then like Fred Willard is basically playing the same character as in Best in the Show but funnier funnier you know like this time it's because because you know, like he plays like in like an anchorman type of sleeve bag who actually asked people after they're not nominated saying why why didn't you get nominated so yeah so like people always talk about best in show but they never really talk about for your consideration yes i yield my time sorry sorry about that i i took my headphone out for two seconds to answer to somebody and that's when you said it my bad man all right Go ahead and skip the time forward. There we go. Close enough. All right. So we are going to go into the four-minute open discussion here. Now, there are technically no rules. The only thing that I ask is that you be respectful of each other. Give each other a chance to speak back and forth. But other than that, I'm sure you guys will find a rhythm in there. The timer starts when the first competitor speaks. So I would say that both of our movies are underrated. And some people talk about Best in Show, but in the film community, they talk about two movies, Waiting for Guffman and For Your Consideration. So all of these movies are known by us because we're movie people. The reason it's underrated is because it's not appreciated by the masses. And it's something, it has every, something everybody likes, dogs. Everybody likes dogs and everybody likes laughing. So why this movie isn't like one of the classics is beyond me. I actually have seen more people talk about Best in Show than uh, like for your consideration, and then like I do like Best in Show, but I realized it's really almost a one joke movie. They're weird and they love their dogs. There's nothing else to it, you know. You know, like if it had like maybe maybe, maybe you know like you know like three duos, I would have liked it more. But and then like mine, you know, you know, like it shows you you know like how crazy the Hollywood system can be. So, yeah, but still, I do like Best in Show. It's just like, no, I mean, nobody in the film community, I mean, I've asked like 10 people in the film community, have you ever seen For, for Your Consideration? They all said no, but but I asked them, have you seen Best in Show? And they all said yes. Yeah, but how many movies do we need where it's Hollywood talking about Hollywood, even in a silly way? Like, the, the absurd concept of Best in Show is that it's just a dog show. Like, how insane could people be? And they could be completely nuts. And they could take it out on each other, and it's just manic. Yeah, but like Hollywood talking about Hollywood though, this is a special situation because like it is about what people do to get nominated, which we which we've never really seen that since. You know, you know, you know, like and then like Catherine O'Hara might might actually like give her best performance that that like no one talks about. And then like you know, like like Jane Lynch is funny in it, and then like Harry Shareer actually, I think, was my favorite part watching it again, you know, for the first time in like 15 years. So, yes, yeah, but, you know, like, like Best in Show is really, really, really good. But I actually, you know, like, for your consideration, it is one that should be talked about, you know, like, up there with Spinal Tap and then, and then you know, like, Best in Show and Waiting for Guffman. See, it all, yeah, it always comes back to Waiting for Guffman and Spinal Tap. Like, it should, Best in Show should be on that list. Because, and that's why it's underrated. It doesn't get put on the pedestal of the top tier mockumentary movies, which apparently all involve Christopher Guest. I mean, let's face it, the dude's a legend. Uh, but I think it's just the little things. Like Jim Pittock, I mean, he steals the movie as a guy that's just trying to 
keep this the sanity together when everything around him is going crazy. Yeah, but you know, like two, 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 like if you ask some people, most of them have seen Best in Show. A lot of them have not seen for your consideration. And then and then like you know, like youth of like Jim Jim Piddick, Harry Sharir in using the speedo at the very end to promote his, his like sitting diet in a day had me dying. And then the scene where I think it's like Fred Willard pushes the woman practically off um off the stool um uh off the um off off the restaurant thing you know like just after why do you think think that, like you were not you were you were not nominated you know like so yeah that's funny and then the trash line you know like this movie has so many quotes that people don't even really think about and then and then like you know like best in show is actually you know like is good but it's just you know like one joke one one, one joke versus you know, like there's like tons of joke jo tons of different it's types scary. of jokes in and for your consideration so yeah what makes it, it being underrated means it's great and not appreciated like you've said yourself many times the best of show is really good but Maybe people it. still have heard of it though you know in the film community i ask people yeah but it. not on the level that it should be and that is time all right good job for our first time there that was a good back and forth uh we're gonna go ahead and jump into your one minute closings jeremy you are back up first so the timer will start for you when you begin speaking So like I was saying in the argument, the open argument, uh, for a movie to be underrated, it has to be good, right? Like Super Mario Brothers isn't an underrated video game adaptation, right? Waiting for Guffman and uh, Spinal Tap aren't underrated. The best in show makes me laugh just as much and is just as well put together as those two movies in the world of mockumentaries. And that's why it's underrated. Underrated is unappreciated, even if it's acknowledged. Thank you. I actually think that, that you oh, know, that. Hold on like, one second. Uh, oh, sorry. No, nope, you're good. Okay. I actually think, think that, like, underrated is, 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 is actually not like, you know, like, it that under underrated is, is actually like unacknowledged. Un, un People know about Best in Show. I mean, like, people don't really know about For Your Consideration. And then, like, you know, like, it is, and, and then, they're like, I actually watched it again. It's actually funnier every time. Best in Show was good, but I think that, like, For Your Consideration is actually really funnier. It's because of, because, because of, you know, like, like, because, like, how much the characters really do lose themselves, you know, like, just to get an Oscar nomination. So, yeah, so, yes, but Best in Show is good good and people know about it. people do not know anything really about for your consideration so yes i, I yield my time all right all right guys good first round there i'm gonna go ahead and put you guys in the back and we will bring the judges on screen uh for their decisions uh we're gonna go straight into it uh i will not be fact checking most of what these guys say tonight because my throat's killing me and i don't want to talk the extra amount zach i'm going to go to you who gets the vote and what was your main selling point <clears throat> i went with jeremy for the first round uh for two reasons i felt like he explained more about his movie and i kind of wish ross told me more positives about for your consideration so because of that, I went with Jeremy. Okay. Uh, Brian, down to you. Same question. Yeah, I'm going to go to Ross on this one. There was somebody was the, the point where he was talking about where he, he asked people, say, ask people like, do you recognize our freaking stations? And they they don't. And he talked more about how, how underrated it is compared to Jeremy. So Ross gets my point. Okay. Which means, Jake, we're going to go to you for the tie break. Who gets the vote? I also have Ross getting the point here. He did talk more about the, like, no one actually talked about ratings, but he at least talked about who uh, who had seen it and uh, asking people about seeing it. So Ross gets it there. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go ahead and put you guys in the back and bring the competitors back in as we're going to go ahead and move on to question number two. As we are at the start of February, uh, at the time of upload, we're about a week or so removed from the Oscar nominations being released. Now, it is worth noting 
that at the time of recording, the Oscar nominations have not been released yet, but once this is uploaded, they will have already. However, I think at this point, we have a feeling of what is going to be nominated for Best Picture, just based off of other award shows, the buzz that is uh, going around about the different films. And so for the second question, uh, the question is, which film, which I, I will put the banner up in just a moment, because... Uh, I changed the wording in the way that I sent it to you guys, so I have to correct it. Uh, the question is, let me let me say the right wording. Every once in a while, I fuck up just a little bit. This is one of those times. Uh, here it is. So the question is, what film from 2022 has the best chance at winning Best Picture? Now, again, at the time of recording, technically, the Best Picture nominees have not been announced. So by all good gracious, should one of these not be nominated? Don't hold it against these guys. They didn't know. It With that happen. said, though, which film has the best chance of uh, has the best chance of winning Best Picture? Ross, we're going to go to you first, so I'll bring the timer up. It'll start when you begin speaking. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually pick The Fablemans, only because like it's a movie about the love of movies directed by the Oscars guy. Steven Spielberg, and then like you, you, you know, like why I, they love movies that are the Academy like loves to nominate movies about directors making movies about them about their young selves. So yeah, so so yeah, so like yes, and then and then like every year there's always a safe pick that gets nominated, and this year the Fablemans is that safe is that safe safe pick about the love of movies. Yeah, I yield my time. All right, so we'll go ahead and skip the timer forward. Jeremy, you have one minute on the clock when ready. Yeah, I'm not an Oscars guy. Uh, I don't watch the show every I haven't watched in years. It's gotten ridiculous. But one thing is for sure, when hype for a movie lasts all year, I think this came out in March, April, maybe before then, when it lasts all year, you can almost count on a Best Picture nomination. And the movie I chose is Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uh, it's immensely high on all the ratings, Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, all that stuff. Uh, it, positive reviews across the board. Uh, it heralded as a comeback for one of the actors that we'll get to in a minute. And just all around astonished everybody that saw it, even me. Like, it's not my favorite movie of 2022, but I think it is definitely the most likely to win Best Picture. How you? Uh, okay, so we have the Fablemans versus Everything Everywhere all at once. Uh, with that said, Ross, we're going to turn it back over to you for the two-minute section. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay. The Academy has been proven for years. They love two things. They love movies that show the love about movies, and they love Spielberg. And then this has both of them. So yeah, a Spielberg making a movie about himself, you know, like about about his love of making movies, is going to, you know, is probably just just like, you know, like gonna win Best Picture. You know, like it's not my favorite movie of the year. I don't I don't even really care for it, but you know, like, but still like you know, like it's a, it's a movie that the Academy usually goes for. And like everything everywhere all at once might be a little bit too weird for the Academy. So yeah, so they actually like want to go for something you know like that they know it and it, and you know like it is familiar. So yeah, so yeah, you and my time. All right, go ahead and skip it forward. All right, Jeremy, you have two minutes on the clock for yourself. When ready, sir. I feel like my argument to this is going to just sound like a Stefan sketch from the, the Bill Hader sketch from the old Saturday Night Live stuff, uh, because this movie literally has everything. It has a great script and story and directing from the Daniels, uh, Daniel Kwan and Daniel uh, Scheinert. Uh, incredible acting. The editing is incredible as they move through the multiverse and everything changes, but it's still kind of the same. The way you get from place to place looks incredible. Production design 
is amazing and also kind of silly. I mean, you get googly eyes and hot dogs for hands. Like it, it reaches every audience. Like there's action, there's comedy, there's family story. It, there's everything. I mean, and every time you think it's gone somewhere, it goes somewhere else. And then it goes somewhere else. And then it goes somewhere else. And it really does give you everything everywhere all at once. Uh, Ki Hui Kwan, we got a comeback from short round. Like, and it's one of the big stories of the year. Like, he's getting awards buzz. He's getting everything talked about him. Uh, Michelle Yeoh is always great. And she comes in and gives one of the best performances of her career. Stephanie Su, I, th I think I'm saying that right. Su, Shu. Um, she comes in and it plays just the straight up daughter and the, with the family issues, but is also like this incredibly overpowered villain at the end of the day. Um, fantastic. Has everything you need for an Oscar winner. I'll yield my time. All right. Go ahead and bump this forward. So we're going to go ahead and go minute, go into the four minute open discussion period. The timer will start back up once the first competitor speaks. Okay, with yours about like how it gets like weird and goofy, the academy is a bunch of like old, no, they're like it's changing, but the slow changing line, like they're like old, stodgy men. They're not gonna really go for something that crazy. They just want to. They they go for like what they know, and then like you know like the Fablemans is actually you know, like everything they 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 know. And like yes, Kihu Kwan is, is amazing, but also Paul Dano also might have given the best performance of his career. You know, you're like so yeah, so like you know like it it, it has like both sides. You know, like and plus plus if you'll notice. The Academy usually go. The Academy usually goes for like movies that and like celebrate film, and this film is the one that celebrates film through Spielberg's eyes. And then like Steven Spielberg is like one of the most like nominated directors ever. So yeah, so so you see like it might be a little bit too weird for the Academy for everything ever all at once. It could be, but if they really want to celebrate film, the this movie is the way to celebrate it. It's original. It's not a retold story or a semi-autobiographical. There's no remakes. It's completely original. And you don't know where it's going. Like, the whole film is an experience. And when you put the sound design, the editing, production, the score and, and soundtrack that my son Lux, uh, it's so well put together that the argument against it is just that Hollywood it likes Hollywood. If Hollywood wants to reward Hollywood for being original, then this is the movie that will take Best Picture. Yeah, though, but it is original. But though, like, um, I could see some Academy members like turning it off after that one fight, you know. Uh, but then you know, like, but then like, you know, like, so then like, you know, you don't know what, like, and plus, plus, you know, you know, like the Academy like is like older, so then like, you know, like it might. You know, you know, it might be a little bit too out there for them, you know. So yeah, like, but I could see though, you know, like, but the Fablemans, you know, like it's right at the Academy's alley, you know, like with John Williams score and Steven Spielberg directing, you know, like I think for one last time, you know, so not one last time, but so yeah, you know, like I just think that everything everywhere all at once is a little bit too out there for them and then like you know like they just the academy always finds ways to reward spielberg for being spielberg so but for the sake of the most likely film to win best picture i've heard people talk about the fablemans but it hasn't had a year-long hype train like ever since this everything everywhere all at once came out in its original limited release it did nothing but build and build and build and build it's the most successful film in a24 history by a wide margin yeah. at this point it has crushed every expectation. Nobody saw it coming. And sometimes a big surprise, a big jolt of energy is what Hollywood needs. Yes. And too bad, though. Too bad, uh, you know, like to be fair, though, too, the Fablemans have not had a year long thing because it came out in November, Christmas weekend, week. So, so the whole like year thing, you know, like if it, if it come out in March and it said that, you know, that would be fair. But the, you know, like, you know, like in November and plus, yes. plus it just, Steven Spielberg just won the Golden Globe. And twice 
you know, you're like, you're like for the Fablemans. But this movie, the Fablemans, was released in this time for Oscar's consideration. Everything, everywhere, all at once was released just to release. Like it was early, in, it was in the spring, and it's yeah. it's carried this momentum all year long to where it's still going to be one of the two favorites, both of which we picked to win Best Picture at the end of the year anyway. So to carry that momentum for nine, ten months is incredible. Yeah, but though, but yeah, but you know, like they were talking about it being likely, you know, but and time. All right, so we're going to go on to the one minute closing period. Ross, you're back up first. Okay, you're thinking about the whole like monthly thing, you know, you know, you know, like like yes, it was released, but like it was not released as an Oscar Oscar film, so so it actually like had time to build. The Fablemans, you know, like was talked about, you know, like maybe it could be good, maybe it could be bad, you know, like and then like it was actually released during Oscar time. I, I bet you that if it came out in March, it it, it wouldn't have, like have a huge thing too. But there's no way to know that. So 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 to so so to say though that like everything ever all at once has more hype, isn't really fair because you know like one month versus versus like almost a full year, yeah. So yeah, but you know um. And then, like you know, like and then, like I really do hope that it wins, wins everything we're all at once. But the Fablemans probably will win, and then it's not my favorite film of the year, not by far. But you know, I still do, you know, you know, like either like uh, either film wins, it will be great. But yeah, you know, I just think that the Fablemans is more of the safe pick. I yield my time. All right, Jeremy, you have the final minute of the round. Time starts when you begin speaking. I feel like a film that will probably be nominated for a number of the individual awards that it may not win, that films that usually stack up both technical and acting nominations have a great, greater than even money chance to take home Best Picture. Uh, at the end of the day, like this thing has been a monster all year. To be the number one runner and a lot of people's lists being released that early in the year is a great indicator that this thing might just pull it out. Um, and again, man, I'm just happy to see Short Round back. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It made me interminably happy to see him come back to acting and to embrace it again and to have fun, man. This is fun. I yield. All right, guys. I'm gonna be so honest with you guys. Too. I really do. I really do hope that like everything ever all at once does win because it's my second favorite movie of the year. And the film didn't even make my top ten. I just had to argue for it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put you guys in the back. Um, we will bring the judges in and go for it. Brian, who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? I'm gonna give it to Jeremy on this one. He was talking about the hype all your all your round and. Even knock knock down uh, Ross's point about how about uh, not being that that well well received now than it was earlier. So I'm going to give Jeremy. Okay, Jake, down to you. Um, I got Ross from the point that the Academy is still a bunch of old dudes that like to blow each other, um, and also he was able to counter that hype argument by saying that there was no that you can't accurately compare that because. Who knows if Fablemans would have come out in March if it would have had that. So he was able to counter Jeremy there, so Ross. Okay. And which means, Zach, I'll go to the tie-breaking vote once again. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? I'm going to go with Jeremy on this one uh, because he gave more reasons for his film. He, I love the line that this movie is an experience and about how it came out earlier in the year and it was still able to ride that hype train all the rest of the year. So for that, I went with Jeremy. All right, judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and put you in the back and we're going to move on to question number three here. And question number three in this matchup is a viewer submitted question as we often have, because I mean, people who watch sent in such a big, vault of questions you know i have to use them at some point uh so this is a viewer submitted question this one is brought to us by fellow competitor chadwick webb uh and the question is 
what is the best supporting performance in any Jordan Peele produced film? Now, if you're doing a double take at home and thinking, what do you mean by produced? This is a technicality change because Jordan Peele has produced all of the work that he's directed, but he's also written and produced multiple other films that he just did not physically direct. So by wording it this way, it opened up the vault a little bit more. You can get in some other films uh, as potential options. Uh, but his directorial work is also included. It's not excluded because he's produced everything that he's directed because, you know, I guess the Comedy Central sketch guy gets that type of power in Hollywood. Uh, but with that said, we're going to go ahead and jump into the argument. Jeremy, you are up first once again. So I'll give you the timer and it'll start once you begin speaking. Jordan Peele uh, kind of came out of nowhere into the dramatic film industry. I mean, into horror and all the stuff when he broke out with Get Out and then Us and now Nope. Like his directed movies are incredible. Produced stuff like The Candyman. Like he does great stuff. And this was a very difficult one to choose. Uh, but I went with Michael Wincott in Nope. Um, he comes in as this character that's kind of mysterious. They refer to him, they try to contact him. And then eventually just his pure curiosity uh, brings this character in and he comes in and helps, tries to help the other characters accomplish their goal of taking a picture of, the, of this thing. They just want to get the shot. And that's what Michael Wincott is in this movie. He represents that director's need to get that one perfect shot. And he plays it beautifully. All right. That is time on the opening minute. Ross, over to you. I am um I am actually going to pick Steven Root and get out. It's because like you know, like we've seen Michael Wincott, you know, like do this before, you know, like his like weird performances. But the, like, you know, like we've never seen Steven Root really that serious, you know, like uh not like in Barry, but I mean, I mean, like you know, like, like it's how like he seems like the kind guy, but then like he actually has like a sinister motive. We've seen other actors do that, but not Stephen Root. Stephen Root, so yeah, you know, like and then like Stephen Root, you know, like plays the blind photographer who needs the eyes. So then it makes you, you know, like so. So then like you wonder, you know, before you, you you're, you're like this. Okay, this guy's gonna help out the hero, but then you realize. No, he's not a good dude. And then, like his performance, you know, like is something that we've never seen Stephen Root do before. Yeah, so I'm gonna yield my time. All right, so it is Michael Wincott versus Stephen Root. Note versus Get Out. Jeremy, you have two minutes on the clock. The time starts back up when you begin speaking. I mean, I'd love to see this fight in real life. Could you imagine Michael Wincott versus Stephen Root? Be insane. Uh, but Michael Wincott in. Uh, Nope was something I didn't see. You don't see coming in the movie. Uh, they don't really address it early on, which the movie is, you know, it's a Jordan Peele movie. It's very strange and open strange. And it builds in a very weird way. But really the movie is kind of three things. Uh, you have the behind the scenes guy, the brother, like he represents like your, your crew for a movie. And then you have, you have your star, your talent is up front and that's Kiki Palmer. But then what you need for all that to work is a director. And Michael Wincott represents the filmmakers. He is the embodiment of trying to get that perfect shot in a movie. But he's trying to get the perfect shot of this thing that's flying around this horse ranch that's sucking people up and spitting out quarters. It, he just wants to get it. He, the old hand crank camera. Like it really boils it down to just that one urge to do whatever it takes to get that perfect shot. And he's so great. Anyway, the graveliness, yes, we've seen him be a little over the top and kind of odd before, but seeing him come back in a movie like this, it is very unexpected casting. It's very unexpected uh, use of him uh, to be so grounded in what filmmaking is, right? It's not just, the movie's not really about the alien and stuff. It's about getting that one shot because that's what's going to make your day. And that's all I got. I yield my time. All right. So go ahead and try and clip the board. There we go. 
All right, Ross, back over to you. Two minutes on the clock when ready. Okay. Okay, like Steven, okay, Michael Wincott, yes. But the, like his surprise, his return to the movie was not a surprise because like he was heavily featured in the marketing. And the, like mine, Steven Root was also, but 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 the trailer, you know, like more pointed out about, you know, like about like Bradley, Bradley Whitford. But still, still, you know, like we've never seen like Steven Root play play the guy who seems like who's like super nice nice and then and then like you know like and then like turns out to be to be more, more sinister and then like actually like get out was actually like more about you know like um about the way the ways that the white people actually you know you know like demean and then like keep down down all the blacks so yeah so so i was like your film is about about you know like like uh filmmaking my film is about society yeah but you know like in steven root actually not like you know you're like perfectly portrays that because like you know, like he's like he's like come in and you know i want to i want to i want you to i want to teach you stuff but then, like he's really using him for his other like interior motive so yeah so yes like you're my, my michael wincott you know you're know, like we've seen him do the gravelly thing before yeah but like we've never seen steven root like play the nice guy with with, with like interior motives so yeah i yield my time all right we're going to go ahead and go into the four-minute open discussion. The timer will start back up once the first competitor speaks. You guys can start once it rolls to zero. I would say that Steven Root is not the best supporting character in a Jordan Peele movie. He's not even the best supporting actor in his movie. I mean, you, you're using Get Out and you don't bring up Catherine Keener who is the, one of the most menacing, scary, just skinny white ladies that's ever been in a movie. Like she's the one that can manipulate and facilitates the whole operation. And she does it with a grin and it's unnerving. She's so good in it. I mean, I probably should have picked her for mine too. Uh, but Michael Wincott is definitely a more important part of the story in his movie than Stephen Root. And he's used beautifully. Like, it's just so much fun. Yeah, but though, but like, actually, I think like Stephen Root's actually like one of the most important is because remember, he needed his eyes. So yes, and like, remember like he was a famous photographer just like that Chris wanted to be. And like Catherine Keener, you know, like um, is actually, you know, like uh, she, you knew that something, something was off with her. Stephen Root just seemed like this guy who was there to help him. So yeah, so and then and then like M M Michael Wincott, you know, like like we've seen him do this type of role before, you know, like Steve Rudy is usually you know like the loud, funny guy, like, like in um in, in dodgeball or 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 now like Office Space, so yeah, you know, like but you know you know not like um yeah and then and then like 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 I I think what was like when when I when I when I when I was like you know like creeped out so yeah you know like i did like your movie you know i love michael wincott but you know but i would say like, we we haven't seen michael wincott in a part like this when you when you think of michael wincott you think of him usually as the the villain he's going out you know he's got the girl he's gonna the heroes have to fight him and he's the one that's just got a little bit more skill and nope he's essentially the hero he comes in with the know-how and the eye for what they're trying to do they want to take a picture of this thing and they can't figure out why they can't. So he brings in his analog hand crank 35 millimeter camera because it's can't be altered. Like he's the one who comes in and saves the day. Steven Root at the end of the day is essentially a plot device. Like he's the reason they want that guy because he, they want his eyes. Like it could have been any reason from any character, but it, He's just there to, to keep it going. Yeah, but you know, like Michael Wincott actually, you know, like um I've actually like seen him you know, you know, like you know, like play this part before and then and then, and like hand crank, you 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 can like are ar argue too now like he he's actually a part a part of this a plot a plot point too. It's because if you really think about it, you you know like he has maybe like ten to fit he has okay, he shows up in the middle and then the and then the uh and and then and then like you you know you know you know like they could have written that like any other way for now like him to now like uh 
can for them to like get that camera versus now like you know, like the character being blind needed the eye you know you like and then and then like you you know so yeah so yeah but you know like i do like your movie a lot though too you know i love nope but yeah and i think it's interesting that both of our arguments are revolving around somebody trying to see something i think that's jordan peele in a, in a nutshell yeah. like he's always trying to show us something isn't he yes i do <laughs> Yes, and like, and then like Michael Wincott's most like underrated movie is a movie that's on HBO Max now. It's called Strange Days. Say, yeah, I have heard. I need to watch. But okay, yeah, but yeah, yeah, you know, this it's still, you know, like, you know, like you, both of ours, you know, are about eyes. So yeah, we, I yield my time. And time. All right, we're gonna go into the one minute closings. Jeremy, you're up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Like I said, uh, Stephen Root's not even the best supporting actor in Get Out. I mean, Catherine Keener and even Bradley Whitford knock it out of the park. They're so nice, but then not, but not like Stephen Root's just kind of that friendly old foghorn leghorn southern guy until the very end of the movie. Uh, Catherine Keener, we realize what she's doing much earlier. And it's much more important. And she does it well. I mean, like, she does everything well. But at the end of the day, Michael Wincott brings in, and I hate to use the word because I know it gets used a lot, but gravitas to the scenes he's in. Like, when he's talking, it's serious. Everybody's listening. Everybody stops what they're doing because this is the guy that's going to help them get what they want. And they're smart enough to let him try to do it. All right, that is time. Ross, you have the final minute when ready. Okay, you brought up about you know you know, like about like how 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 not like you know you like Steam Root do, does not show up show how you brought brought up about, about about them them you know like being being all nice and you like find out something is up up way earlier. I actually think it's creepier to not know until the very end versus you know, like some something is up is because you know, like. Michael Wincott, you know, like you knew that you knew like he was a weird dude from the start, versus now like Stephen Root, you know, like play plays that character of, of of you know like a really really nice nice person until the very end, and then and then like it's better to not to not know the motives until the, until the very end. So so yeah, I move my I I yield my time. All right. Thank you, guys. Once again, I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back and allow the judges to make their call. We'll go ahead and bring them in. And Jake, you are up first this time on the rotation, so I'll go to you. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? Um, I'm going to go Ross again here. The never before seen from Stephen Root bit and like how he seems innocent but really is sinister told me a little bit more about the performance than I heard from Jeremy. Okay, Zach, I'll go down to you. Same question. I went with Jeremy again, uh, more because he. I felt like he said more positives about his character while also saying how Stephen Root even wasn't even the best supporting character in his own movie, and because so because of those, I went with Jeremy. Okay, which means we're going to go to the tiebreaker. Brian, who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? I'm also going with, with Jeremy as well. I echo everything what Zach said about how Watson picked the best best person to get out. I talked more how his, his how his his person was the better part of his movie. So Jeremy gets my point. All right, judges, thank you guys so much. We're going to go ahead and move on to question number four here, uh, because. This week, uh, coming up, we are in the first week of February at the time of upload, which means, once again, it is time for another M. Night Shyamalan film. And what do we get with an M. Night Shyamalan film? Fuck knows. That dude's career spans the entire range. He has made Oscar-winning films, and he has made whatever the fuck the happening was. It, it There's just everything. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, even with something like Knock at the Cabin, which in and of itself is based on a book, but so is old, and apparently he made heavy changes to that. So even having source material does not stop this man from doing what he wants to do. 
So all I can confidently say is it's nice to see Rupert Grint on a, on a film screen again. Good for him for getting back there. It took a while, but good for him. With that said, let's talk about Shyamalan. And this question has been angled in such a way because I feel like the consensus around his career is that there are, for most people, there are two definitive bests, The Sixth Sense and Split. So let's pull them out of the equation. The question is, what is the best M. Night Shyamalan film of the 2000s? Let's shoot for the decade right in the middle with the most mixed reception, the most creative ideas, and see what comes out of it. With that said, Ross, you are up first this time around, so you'll have your first minute when you begin speaking. Okay. I'm picking Unbreakable. It's because, like, you know, like Unbreakable, if you really look at it, was actually ahead of its time. Because, like, back then, nobody really wanted a grounded superhero in grounded superhero movie. And then, like, he actually gave us the most grounded superhero movie ever. It's because, you know, like, nobody flies. It's just a really strong dude and a guy whose bones break very easily, who's really smart. You know, like, so, yes. And, and, then, and then, like, every single thing is a reference to a, to a previous comic book. Or something else, you know, like, or or the colors in the movie too. You know, you know, I like whenever I think about that movie, I always think about purple and green. So yeah, so like Unbreakable is easily the best the best drama movie of the two thousands. I yield my time. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to Jeremy, sir. You have your opening minute. Time starts when you begin speaking. I was really hoping he would have picked the happening because that would have made this a lot easier. Um, I did not like the sixth sense. Um, I do like Unbreakable. I am a superhero guy, but I honestly think that the best Shyamalan movie of the two thousands is Signs. Uh, it offers a bunch of weird, um, but it's an alien invasion movie, and also a family drama. And also, it's one of the most M. Night Shyamalanian-ist movies he's made. It's very convoluted. But at the end, he's able to wrap it up and make everything fit together, which he doesn't do in most of his other movies, uh, especially the other ones from the 2000s. So I'm going to go with Signs, and I'm going to swing away. Yeah, I yield my five seconds. All right, so we have Unbreakable versus Signs. I know we're all disappointed because The Last Airbender came out in 2010 and thus it couldn't be picked, but we went with what was next. It's okay. Long, really. uh, oh, we could have picked Lady in the Water, man. <laughs> That's a very different debate. All right, we're going to go ahead and hop into this. Uh, Ross, back over to you. Two minutes on the clock when ready. Okay. Um, okay, yes, Signs is a good movie, but there's a lot of cheesiness. And then, like, every single Night Shyamalan movie has some cheesiness. But, though, like, you you said, said like, how Signs is a family drama, so is Unbreakable. Because, like, it is about, actually, a very broken man. And then the family is, is, is also broken. And then, the, and, the, and then, like, him, him realizing that, that, like, he has, like, supernatural abilities – actually like helps the family get closer together and then there's no like swing away moment and then like like i've seen like unbreakable a lot of times every single thing that is discussed gets brought up late, later on so yeah you know like yes uh so so yes and and then and then i'll well like it started you know like, like the superhero you know you know you know like trying to turn like being being grounded in reality and then i don't think it, it it's been topped in terms of grounded grounded in reality so yeah i yield my time all right so we'll go ahead and move back over to jeremy you have two minutes on the clock the time starts when it flips over to zero i don't think we can discuss Shyamalan movies without discussing the twist right and the twist in Signs is the swing away moment. But it, it, there's so much built. There's so many layers to it. And also the story of a broken man. But once you build to that and you realize, oh, you just got to hit the glasses of water and the water hurts the aliens, it becomes a positive thing. The reveal and the twist in Unbreakable is 
destructive, man. It's heartbreaking. He has this friend that's trying to wake him up and show him that he can help people and be a hero. And the only reason the friend is doing that is so he can have his opposite. Like his friend is a, a mass murderer just trying to find him. There's no positivity in it in any way. But at the end of signs, you're you're kind of lifted up by it. It doesn't have that horrible, oh no, it's oh man, twist. It's more of a oh, if a family trusts each other and listens to each other, at the end of the day, they'll find a way to get through things. And that's why I think Signs is just a little bit better than Unbreakable because it offers a, a little bit of positivity, which usually is completely void in an M. Night Shyamalan movie. And there's almost no ending that goes well in any way. But in this one, you get a little bit, not a lot, just a little. And then they can find a way to fight off this thing that's there that is really... It's very creepy, and the aliens are, have a great design, but the atmosphere and the build towards that moment at the end is what makes it great. All right, that will be time. We're going to go ahead and move into the four-minute open discussion. The timer will start back up when the first competitor speaks. Okay, you brought up about the whole like you know, like sadness, how the ending is sad. It is sad, but but if you remember, him and his wife are gonna reconcile. So so yeah, you know, like so then it is happy, and then like he gets a better relationship with his son, and then the like you know like your film could also be um you know like um sad too though is because you know like um well, like the daughter you know like remember will still have that tick. That's never solved, but this, you know, like, but like Bruce Bruce Willis is learning how to live with it, and like Samuel Jackson, yes, I, I I know that like he did that stuff, but but like without it, I don't think that Bruce Willis and his family would have gotten back together. So yeah, so so yeah, like, and then and and then and then like like why if they would have ju just said like you know you know like if like if Mel Gibson would have would have like figured it out how to how how, how to like hit hit it with the bat. It would have been more more effective than swing away. But that was that's the moment. Like that's the twist. You realize that everybody everybody has their destiny, and when your destiny aligns, especially with your family, your brother, your kids, you can come together as a family and face anything. You can, uh, even if you have lost people, even if it is things aren't great. You're still, you can still survive. Yeah, and but if you, sorry, sorry. No, you're okay. Go ahead. Yeah, but if you remember though, him and his son did did end up getting together. Remember, it's because like the scene, like where it said the, he saves the people. The son looks at him, and, and Bruce Willis goes like, "I think that that's them, like almost like forming a team at that moment." You know, even 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 though that nah, like he's a kid. Kid, if you remember, they didn't really get get along. And then the scene, like you know, like with uh with him lifting weights. That actually like shows about you know like how the family is actually mending, and and then like yeah yes it doesn't come out cleanly and say you know like yeah they're back together the way they're looking at each other you think that the whole family is gonna be like reconciled so yeah so so yes like you know like I do like signs and then like unbreakable if you really think about it well what that's like way 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 uh, uh, ahead of its time but still you know like you know like still like unbreakable though like. I think it's actually the better movie is because, you know, like it's one of the few films to actually determine. I don't know if fate's really a good thing. Well, also science has, I mean, some great performances too in a Shyamalan movie, right? Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix work well off of each other as a guy who's just trying to figure out the next day. And then another guy who's trying to figure out the rest of his life. Like coming back from the loss and the pain and to get over it to a point to essentially figure out how to save the world while well, the rest of the world figures it out at the same time too. But it it's the most enjoyable for me. And uh, I didn't even really discuss how scary and creepy it is because I kind of forget about that because the, 
the twist again is what I remember, which is what everybody remembers from each of his movies. Uh, yeah, but like if you'll notice too, Unbreakable get really scary, like the stairs scene. And then like, you know, like it's about like Bruce Willis is actually like still trying to find himself. And then you're talking about great performances. That kid is the weakest performance. And, and then and then like he's still amazing. You got Bruce Willis, Samuel Jackson, and then Robin Wright Penn. So yeah, you, you know, you know, you know, like I, I do love the subtleties too in, in, in uh, like uh, Unbreakable about, you know, you know, you know, like about like, you know, like how the, how the hero and the villains are sometimes friends and then they make each other. So yeah, you know, like I do love signs, but Unbreakable is where it's And at. time. All right. So we're going to move on to the one minute closing period. Ross, you are up first. So time starts when you begin speaking. Okay. You know, like like the subtleties in Unbreakable, I think are are like better better than the subtleties in Signs, uh, because like you you know you know now like little tile like Unbreakable, you know like it shows how how little you know like how subtly broken Bruce Willis is, and Mel Gibson is broken, but though now like you know you know, like you know like Mel Gibson though you know, you know you know like like does not give a, as good of a performance because you know like this is the most subtle I've ever seen Bruce Willis, and the movie is a comic book movie. But it is also, also like the most like subtle comic book movie I've ever seen. So so yeah. So you know like so yeah. I yield my time. Okay. Go ahead and bump that forward. And Jeremy, your final minute for the round starts when you begin speaking. Signs is a great horror movie. It's a great sci-fi movie. It's a great family drama. It has a great score by James Newton Howard that really gives the atmosphere. I mean, instead of it just being crickets on a farm, because that's what it would be if there was the, the great tones. Uh, but I think it pays off more than the other Shyamalan movies of the 2000s. I mean, obviously, Lady in the Water and The Happening are garbage. Uh, and Unbreakable is really good. But the payoff there is that, oh, the hero has a supervillain. Oh, look, look, look what he did. He's real smart, but he can't run. Like he can't, he can't play basketball. Oh man. But, but he can kill people because he's brilliant. He signs, you get a win. I mean, it's kind of messed up how you get there, but at the end of the day, they get a win. And it's kind of rare to see that in a Shyamalan movie. And time. All right, guys, thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and put you guys in the back and bring our judges in for the deliberation here. Uh, Zach, you are up first this time around, so go ahead and give me your vote and what was the main selling point. I went with Jeremy uh, more because he sold his choice better and he had great counters, especially in his closing against um the like the big moment for unbreakable and how his moment was a was better so because of that i went with jeremy okay brian i'll move down to you same question i'm going to give it to ross on this one he was talking about how everyone gives a good performance even though the kid gives, gives like a, a weak performance but everyone else gives a good performance and how talk about how it's good call book film I thought with a call book film, so Ross gets her point. Okay, which means, Jake, I will go to you. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Uh, Jeremy finally gets a vote out of me uh, with the performances, the design, the score, the twist. He talked a little bit more about, like, the actual movie and why it was better. Okay. All right, judges, well, thank you so much, but I'm going to go ahead and put you guys in the back because... Your winner by a final score of three to one, Jeremy Potters pulling out a debut victory. Jeremy, congratulations, sir. You are officially one and oh in the battleground. A very close match, a well fought match between the two of you guys. Both, I feel like you both did an even job of sort of feeling your way through a first matchup. How are you feeling? I feel good. This was a lot of fun. Um, we both won each other's strength points, which I think is kind of cool. Like that's kind of a fun switch. Like we, I never would have thought that I'd make a better argument for an Oscars question, 
you know, that's to me, that's completely insane. But that's, uh, you know, everything everywhere all at once. You get completely insane when you get to use it. But no, thanks it, for having me, Ross. That weirdly enough, it, that happens more than you'd think. It probably I feel is. like I feel like the strength question is the one someone is most like plausible to lose. It's very weird. To, to, like if you look at, if you look at all of the matches, it's very you're, weird. Yeah, you're gonna pick something you like, and you're gonna be it's gonna be more of a bias. Like I like this thing more than maybe I genuinely think it's the right answer. Uh, but yeah, I had a blast, man. I had a blast. Absolutely, and of course, you know. Well, you know, we're going to bring you back should you want. Uh, we're going to give this a second go. What do you look forward to? Is there anything that you look forward to in a second match or anything you think that you can adjust now that you've had a first matchup? Or kind of how do you feel about that? Well, hopefully when the next one comes, I won't be so entrenched in trivia study. Uh, so maybe I could prepare a little bit better, make better use of my time. Uh, I don't know if there's a record for most yielded time in a match, but we might have said it tonight. Uh, no, know, believe it or not, no. You, no. You yeah. uh, but there, uh, there, there was I for, I forget which exact matchup it was, but th there was a matchup where I can only describe it as a as a half joking pissing contest, where by the end of the match, the competitors were going, "My choice is this: I yield my opening minute," and just all <laughs> of it was scratch. Uh, it was okay. like a competition to see who could finish their sentence quicker. It was very, yeah, it was entertaining, but. Yeah, um, and I'm looking forward to talking about different movies. You know, like that'll be fun. It's always fun to talk about movies, whether you, you absolutely. Know, you're, you're winning a game or not. You know. Yeah, it's absolutely, fun. man. We we I you know we want to have the same fun conversation just with a little bit of competitive edge. Sure. It's great to have you here, sir. I look forward to the next time when we have you back. And until then, take care. We will see you as I go ahead and put you in the back and bring in your competitor and. Ross, obviously, nobody likes losing. It, you know, it's just kind of a general thing. Nobody w goes into something wanting to lose. But all things considered, especially when compared to other debuting matches of other players, I think you and Jeremy came in, It just kind of by luck chance, I think you guys came in and felt very evenly matched. Sometimes when you have rookies, you never really know where someone's at, and you end up with these very haywire matches that are just pure accident. Um, but I think you guys looked very evenly matched. Every single question needed to go to a tiebreaker, which means you guys were competitive with each other and keeping into it. So despite the loss, how are you feeling after the match? I actually feel good, and this was really fun. You know, I just, you know, like, he was a good opponent, you know, and then, like, yeah, so, uh, you know, like, he was really good. I was surprised. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I'll ask you the same question because, of course, you know, should you want to come back, we'll have you back in the near future uh, what do you think? Is there anything that you can kind of take from this match to help you sort of better prepare for next time around? Uh, just prep. You know, I got to prep more. You know, I did prep, but, you know, yeah, I just got to, you know, work on my arguments a little more. But, you know, I will be back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, again, same as well. We'll look forward to having you back, sir. We will see you then. But until then, take care of yourself. And, guys, that is it for tonight's matchup. A, a very good, solid, quick, because my throat's killing me, but good, solid matchup here. Two evenly matched rookies taking each other on, and while one leaves 1-0 and the other leaves 0-1, I think both have a good foundation that could they build upon. They could have some good wins here in this league, uh, but it is Jeremy that does walk away with the win tonight. Uh, I do want to say congratulations to both competitors. Once again, thank you guys for coming here, competing, and making your debuts. Congratulations to Jeremy. Thank you to Ross. Thank you to my judges, Jake, Brian, and Zach, for being here and helping us out through tonight's match. Thank you to all of you for watching at home because uh, you're part of the reason that we do this. It makes me feel good to look at the views and see people actually watch these videos. It's a nice little feeling. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel, rate the video, or drop a comment, and stick around because every single week we have more matchups. Like I said, this is only the first week of the new year, and we have some big matchups coming even in just the next couple of weeks, including uh, before, uh, you know, not before long, we have the next title match in which you guys will get to see the champion Amr Moses back in action, uh, making his first defense. So we have a lot of stuff on the table. Uh, but with that said, on behalf of everyone involved with the show, my name is Aaron Canole. Thank you guys for watching, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone.